Good afternoon. Uh, we are joined by Member of Parliament Nathaniel Erskine-Smith, uh, who will begin with an opening statement and then take some questions. Mr. Smith. Thanks very much. So today, this, this afternoon, I'll have the opportunity to have our first hour of debate for Bill C-293, the Pandemic Prevention and Preparedness Act. I want to speak for a little bit just about why this bill is important, what it does, and, and what I hope it, it's able to do as, as the government hopefully takes it up and improves it at committee, and, and hopefully it will have a long-lasting impact in terms of pandemic prevention and preparedness. It goes without saying, obviously, we have now lost over 45,000 Canadians, and there have been millions of deaths around the world as a result of COVID-19. It has had severe economic negative in economic impacts. When you look at the isolation of our seniors to the school closures for our kids, there have been in incredibly negative consequences these last two and a half years. And it should go without saying that we need to learn the lessons from this pandemic in order to prevent and prepare for the next one. Now, we aren't done with COVID, that much is obvious, but we've also lived through enough to learn from this pandemic and our pandemic response across all levels of government. And those lessons should inform our plans going forward. The bill functionally does three things. It requires the government to establish a review of our COVID-19 response, not just the federal response, but a review of a response at all levels of government and, and across society in terms of the health and economic impacts of both COVID and, and our response. And as a result of that review, the idea is not some kind of gotcha moment to say the government did this wrong, the government did that wrong, and to, to politicize the issue. Far from it. The idea is, at its core, to say what went right, what went wrong, and how do we learn the lessons from our collective response, our, our cross-government response, to ensure that we are putting ourselves in the best position going forward to both prevent future pandemics and to respond to future pandemics in the most prepared way. And as a result of that, the second thing that this bill does is ensures that there is an accountability framework to an, account, an accountability framework to Parliament for all future pandemic prevention and preparedness plans on behalf of the Government of Canada. It's modeled in many ways on our climate, climate on our climate accountability legislation. The idea being that the government will be required, the Minister of Health will be required, and it's not just the Minister of Health, but the Minister of Health in collaboration with other government ministers. This is truly a whole of government approach. But the Minister of Health in collaboration with those ministers must prepare a pandemic prevention and preparedness plan, must develop such a plan, a long list of factors that of course goes into it and a number of ministers that are, that are necessarily involved, and must table that plan in Parliament within two years of the passing of the, of the passage of this bill. And thereafter, we're going to see an updated plan where this isn't a moment in time where a government responds to a particular crisis and then forgets about the crisis 5, 10, 20 years from now. That the, I think if we've learned anything from first SARS and, and now COVID, is that we need to constantly re-examine our prevention and preparedness plans and ensure that this issue remains top of mind because the health and economic consequences are so significant if we, if we live through another pandemic, whereas the costs of prevention and preparedness pale in comparison, they are a small fraction of, of what is ultimately the cost of what we've just lived through. And now, we see a review of COVID-19 and our response. We see an accountability framework to Parliament, the requirement to develop a plan and, and a prevention and preparedness plan table in Parliament. And then lastly, the appointment of a coordinator, a national coordinator to oversee and implement the plan. Again, it's a question of accountability to ensure that there is one individual responsible for seeing this through and ensuring that all of these different parts come together. A few points I wanted to make because it, it's a private member's bill and this took me a very long time in, in collaboration with experts to, to put together. And I drew from the United Nations Environment Programs Report on Preventing Future Pandemics. I drew from the work of IPAS, the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, and a workshop report on preventing fu uh, future pandemics. I also drew from the work of the independent panel and, and the expert researchers that put the independent panel's reports together. I also consulted Canadian experts, including Dr. David Naylor. I, 
I put as much effort as I could into making sure that we got this right. But I will tell you, just the nature of private members' business, and I've introduced my fair share of private members' business over the years, but the idea really here is to make sure I'm putting my best foot forward and then saying to hopefully members of all parties, work with me to ensure we improve this bill at committee because it's, it's not possible that I've gotten every single section right. I've probably over, you know, missed some things and probably incorporated some things that shouldn't have been incorporated. And so let's work together to make sure we are putting ourselves as a country on the best footing we can be to prevent and prepare for future pandemics. The last piece I really wanted to emphasize is and there are many details throughout this bill, I'm happy to answer questions, but, but the main thing to emphasize is the importance of, in developing this plan, a One Health approach. And for those who are unaware of what that approach entails, to put it simply, it just says animal health, human health, environmental health, these are interconnected ideas. We cannot pull these ideas apart. That when you look at the seven key disease drivers of and pandemic risk uh, in the United Nations Environment Programs report, Deforestation, impact on climate change, leads to spillovers from animals to humans and leads to serious risk to human health. That 60% of, 60 of infectious diseases come from animal origins and zoonoses present an incredibly serious risk to human health. And we have to be very careful about that the interaction between ourselves and the environment and the interaction between ourselves and animals, both via industrial agriculture via commercial and illegal wildlife trades that, that, that should be addressed and curbed. And there are so many, and, and through climate change and its impact upon the environment and, and the impact upon increased pandemic risk as a result. So there are so many factors that ought to be considered in the creation of a plan and, and the overriding focus has to be a One Health approach. And the goal here is to ensure that there's a transparent accountability mechanism for the government to table a plan and regularly update its plan and, and tell Canadians every three or five years we are ready if another pandemic hits and we're doing absolutely everything we can to identify key disease drivers, to assess Canadian activities domestic and, and, and abroad that contribute to those key drivers of pandemic risk and to take all steps we possibly can to mitigate that kind of risk and prevent a future pandemic. And with that, I, thanks for Thanks for bearing with me, and, and I'm happy to answer any questions if there are any. We'll move to Zoom. Uh, if you're on Zoom and would like to ask a question, please raise your hand. Okay, Heather Schofield with the Toronto Star. Sorry, can, can you hear me okay? We can, yeah. Can you hear me? Okay, okay, sorry, thanks. Um, there have been, so, been so many economic effects um, to, to the pandemic, you know, uh, huge intervention from the Bank of Canada, from the federal government, inflation, um, you know, massive unemployment and so forth. Uh, does your bill envision looking at that as well and how do we make sure we are we're ready on that front as, as well the next time we get hit by a crisis or does that have to be dealt with separately so a couple things to say so one the review absolutely ought to look at these factors so we do have an assessment from the auditor general for example that's looking more concretely at government spending but the pandemic review that i had envisioned was yes largely health focused but also if you look at the scope of the review, it would also analyze the health, economic, and social factors relevant to the impact of the pandemic in Canada. And the idea there was to be broad enough that it would encapsulate exactly what you are speaking of, because obviously it upended our lives in so many different ways throughout the pandemic, and it is having serious reverberations on a going forward basis. And, and I think the inflation challenges that we were living through and the aggressive interest rate hikes that we were living through are, are a testament to that. So yes, the review absolutely should be very much focused on that. In terms of the pandemic prevention and preparedness plan itself, it's, I would say it's, it's more focused on, uh, it, it does focus on certain factors related to vulnerable populations. It focuses on ensuring that we have a, a health workforce that is, that, is, that is at the ready. It ensures that we are looking at 
you know, issues that are not only federal, but obviously this cuts across jurisdictions like paid sick days. But in terms of the uh, the specific sort of income security supports, that would be an area where I think the you know the pandemic prevention and preparedness plan ought to examine. But I, but it's not spelled out as concretely as it maybe should be. And it's actually just it, it's a good area where and, I, and as I go through the list of factors and. And uh, if you have follow-up questions, I'm happy to answer them in relation to the list of factors. But as you go through the list of factors, the idea, we, we try to be as exhaustive as we could be, whether it's border control, whether it is the a look at gl uh, global health equity and, and vaccine equity and, and, and equity around testing and treatment, and that's a matter for, for global affairs, whether it's looking at land use and, and deforestation and, and the wildlife trade and looping in the Minister of Environment. Uh, but I, I think you are right to highlight that the Minister of Finance should have a much more serious role to play in looking at the social safety net as we live if we were to live through a future pandemic. Okay, thanks. And if I can just ask a follow up. Yeah, sure. Um, uh, so, so the NDP has called for a, a public inquiry, and um, you know, Preston Manning has his thing on the go too. Um, how? You know, would your how how do those all how do these pieces all fit together? I mean, do, could your your bill kind of subsume their request for uh, for inquiry? It's possible. The goal I had in mind, living in politics for the last seven years, I'm always wary of a really serious issue that gets politicized and is, and gets sent sideways as a result of that politicization. And and so, my view is we should be dealing with this issue in, in an incredibly serious and as as objectively, uh, uh, in a very serious manner and as objective manner as possible. And so where there are reasons to say the response was insufficient, where there are reasons to say we could do better next time, we need to learn those lessons. But what I don't want to see is a situation where we focus on this line of spending and that line of spending and, and deeply politicize uh, the pandemic response by way of criticism. If, if the end goal is criticism, I think that's a, a, a very poor result in, in, in terms of our efforts. So the goal here fundamentally is to say, let's look at the health, economic, and, and social factors related to our collective pandemic response, what went right, what went wrong, and how do we do better with a view to informing uh, best efforts going forward. And, and for me, the any review, whether it's a citizen-led review, whether it's a, an independent government-appointed review, whether it's a, a parliamentary review, any review can't be caught up in scoring points. It has to be very much focused on future prevention and preparedness efforts. We'll move to uh, Patrick Kane. Well, thank you so much. Is there a country abroad that we should be emulating that does this kind of funding well in your opinion? Sorry, I mean, would you say, is there a country abroad? Is there a country abroad that does this kind of planning well in your view that we should be emulating? It's a good question, and I, and I have to be honest, I didn't have a particular country in mind when I was putting this together. I, I, I learned a lot in the course of our climate accountability discussions and debates, where in 2006, the UK actually had put together climate accountability legislation that I think has stood the test of time in a serious way, and our climate accountability law passed in the last parliament is modeled very much on that kind of legislation. And so when I was reading the United Nations Environment Programs report from July 2020, thinking what can we do to make sure we never live through a situation like this ever again. And I marry, I, you know, the idea was to marry the, the need to be more explicit and transparent in our prevention and preparedness efforts and to really squarely focus our, our efforts on not just, yes, vaccine manufacturing capacity, yes, in terms of the resilience of, of our healthcare workforce and, and paid sick days and, and all of the above. Every single debate that we've had throughout this pandemic in a serious, thoughtful way at times, but also making sure we are squarely focused on that prevention question, which I think gets lost sometimes. And how do we make sure that this government and all future governments focus their attention on, on that question? Well, the, the model of the climate accountability legislation is, is a pretty useful one, where the government's forced to undertake a reporting every you know, in this case, uh, I've suggested three years. It, it could be amended to five years. So, but on a regular, on a recurring basis, that the government would come back to Parliament, to the Canadian public, and say, 
these are our plans and our attention remains focused on this critical issue. It hasn't, it hasn't fallen off the table and it's, it's, it remains on, on the political agenda. And so I, I, that's a long way of saying I'm not sure if there's one country that gets it right. I know there are many serious international conversations that, that different countries are having right now. I know when the G20, for example, there's been a really serious conversation around a One Health approach and pandemic preparedness. And so this was a way of also ensuring that at a national level, we're having those same conversations. Thank you so much. Let me follow that up. Um, what role would the provinces have uh, in, in, this, in this office as you visualize? I mean, a lot of these pandemic responsibilities, public health responsibilities are provincial, as I'm sure you're aware. This is the greatest challenge in some ways to pandemic prevention preparedness in Canada, that you have a situation here where not only is, does this require a whole of government approach across different ministries that are oftentimes siloed, even at just the federal level. And so this bill requires collaboration as between the Minister of Health and the Minister of Agriculture and the Minister of Industry and the Minister of Transportation, Minister of Global Affairs, the Minister of Public Safety. So, uh, and, and Heather's right, that the Minister of Finance should be seriously involved as well. But you also have a situation where you need global collaboration. And at the same time, in the domestic context, in the context of our federation, so much of the pandemic response falls to, to provinces and territories. And so the, the bill tries to address this core, the, this reality, and, and, and I'll use, uh, you know, I'll emphasize one example, but so in the course of establishing a pandemic prevention and preparedness plan, the plan must ensure sustained collaboration between the Minister of Health and provincial governments and indigenous communities and in the development of the plan in order to align approaches and address any jurisdictional challenges. So it, the, that, co that question is squarely addressed in the legislation, but so much will depend upon implementation and, and good faith relationship building and collaboration. And, and what one would hope to see if this bill were passed is that you'd see simulations and table topping exercises and you see ongoing, not only conversations and, and negotiations and, and collaboration, but you see active exercises as between levels of government to make sure that we are finding our way through some of those jurisdictional challenges in between now and, and, and any future health crisis. There are no further questions on Zoom, so thank you very much. Well, I, I, appreciate, uh, I appreciate those who joined, and I appreciate the questions. And if, if anyone has follow-up questions, um, you know where to find me, and I appreciate the time.